फॉर्मली जो है वो इसको स्टार्ट करता हूँ तो लेट मी ब्रिफली इंट्रोड्यूस यू टू अवर ऑडियंस तो एज वी ऑल नो वी आर मूविंग अहेड टू अवर लेक्चर सीरीज एंड फॉर टूडेज लेक्चर इन बायोलॉजी वी हैव डॉक्टर अजय कुमार फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ प्लांट साइंसेज सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ केरला ही हैज परस्यूड पी एच डी फ्रॉम स्कूल ऑफ लाइफ साइंसेज जवाहरलाल नेहरू यूनिवर्सिटी आफ्टर दैट ही मूव टू सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ केरला एंड वर्किंग एज असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर हिज कोर एरिया इज मैंग्रोव एंड वेरियस अदर बेनिफिशियल प्लांट विच आर वेरी मच ऑफ इम्पॉर्टेंस फॉर द ह्यूमन मैन काइंड एंड एक्चुअली द टाइटल ऑफ हिज लैब इज ऑल्सो ह्यूमन एंड प्लांट्स एंड ह्यूमन and he has published approximately uh, 20 research papers and he is working on three uh, books already published one uh, one book of oh, actually yeah. so uh, he is an epic eminent personality to talk about uh, the uh, mangroves and its importance for uh, the coastal uh, people so now i invite uh, dr ajay kumar to deliver his talk for our lecture series ठीक है थैंक यू थैंक यू सर आई विल स्टार्ट प्रेजेंटिंग आई थिंक आई कैन शेयर इट फ्रॉम हेयर राइट शेयर स्क्रीन ना हाँ इट इज विजिबल ना ओके पुट इट इन प्रेजेंटेशन मोड आई होप इट्स विजिबल या इट इज विजिबल uh thank you uh, dr arun for inviting me to deliver this uh, talk um, on mangroves um i have basically chosen a very simple topic on mangroves what are basically mangroves and why are they important and uh, uh, through this uh, slides i will show you that uh, you know how they survive under extreme environmental conditions so i will i will give give you an overview of under what kind of uh, stresses they survive these mangroves basically are very very different from other terrestrial plants in a wide variety of ways and since they are different from other organisms they must deploy some kind of different strategies to you know survive under uh, different conditions and how they are different from other organisms uh, that also we will uh, uh, see in this particular lecture this is the one example of uh, you know the different um, very different uh, lifestyles of these mangroves if you have seen if you have visited the coastal areas of uh, uh, southern india especially uh, and then in the sundarbans uh, in west bengal there you will see very very unique uh, plants which you know uh, which grow along the coast and they act as a very important shield against uh, you know um, uh, wide Uh, variety of disasters including tsunamis uh, waves and all those things so very peculiar kind of uh, system they have so basically if you if you ask me what what are mangroves so they are basically a group of uh, small trees and shrubs belonging to nearly 80 species of flowering plants and 
The most peculiar condition of these mangroves is that they survive under extreme environmental uh, stresses, which, which, in, which includes submergence, anoxia, salinity, oxidative stress, and osmotic stress. This is basically different from other uh, uh, plants. Sometimes you must see uh, that a particular plant is tolerant to one kind of stress, like submergence. Uh, stress or some plants may be uh, tolerant to anoxia or there are certain plants which are you know uh, tolerant to salinity stress or oxidative stress but uh, these plants are unique in that sense that all, all these stresses are together influencing these plants and they have to survive against all these stress, stresses at the same time if you look at normally, for example, now uh, you take those plants which we uh, use for producing the crops like rice, wheat, maize or other uh, uh, plants for which you know you, you, would, you would see that uh, they do not face all these stresses together and there are scientists who are working towards uh, producing uh, crops which are salinity uh, stress tolerant or those plants which are tolerant to other stresses, biotic stresses and all those things so that we can produce uh, disease resistant or bio, abiotic stress resistant cultivars so that uh, increasing temperature for example is an issue because of global warming. But if you look at these mangroves they are inherently i mean they have their own capacity to tolerate all these kind of different stresses and they have uh, uh, evolved various specialized mechanisms to uh, cope up with these uh, stresses altogether before going to you know how the plants deploy these kind of different mechanisms to uh, different stresses uh, let me uh, begin with uh, this particular slide and where are they, these mangroves located? They basically occupy uh, more than 180 countries. Uh, basically, mostly they are found in the, uh, in, in the coastal, coastal areas, in the tropics and subtropics. And uh, they, they, uh, they are found um, uh, within this particular zone, they, do, they are not found in the uh, mainstream uh, uh, towards the land, but in the coastal areas only they uh, they are located. And on the right side, this is the figure of uh, India and the different states in which these mangroves are found. You can see the coastal states, uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu. Uh, then you have Gujarat, uh, you know, um, and Karnataka. West Bengal, all these states, uh, you will see the mangroves presence and maximum of them are found in the uh, this West Bengal region, which is uh, part of uh, Sundarban mangroves. And then if you take, uh, you know, what, uh, what, how much area do they occupy uh, in different countries and, if, and in India? These are top 15 countries in which uh, these mangroves uh, are found and uh, this, uh, in these countries like uh, Ashmore and Cartier Islands, Australia, Bangladesh, Brazil, Burma, Guinea, Bissau, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Mexico and maximum of these mangroves are found in these, uh, you know, uh, in these countries, whereas in uh, when you uh, uh, take up India, then West Bengal is number one, and then Andhra. Uh, the second one is Gujarat, then uh, Andhra Pradesh, and similar other states also. So overall, twelve states and UTs of India represent these mangroves, and various species like. In, Andu, uh, in uh, Andhra Pradesh, we have 22 species of mangroves, Goa 16, Gujarat 15, uh, you know, then Puducherry 15, 
in Kerala 19, Maharashtra 22, and various species are the composition of these species vary in different states. Now, the next question is why are they important? Recently, 26th, uh, you know, 26th July is uh, celebrated as International Day of Mangroves. So, if we celebrate these mangroves internationally, why are they important? What are their, uh, what is their importance? This particular slide sums up uh, the most important uh, relevance of for the uh, uh, this kind of mangroves. I will start with the, this one: habitat for a number of species. These mangroves are not just you know species of the plants, but they are uh, mangroves are an ecosystem itself. They uh, they actually uh, are a very rich habitats for a number of different species, including birds, insects, other animals, um, and many more uh, organisms. They act as a breeding and spawning ground for various marine creatures, including fish, crabs, uh, and you know other aquatic. Uh, animals. Then wood and fuel, they are a source of uh, wood and fuel for the coastal communities. Fourth important uh, point is the food and medicine. These mangroves provide a huge amount of food and medicines from uh, this, their habitats. Food in the, uh, you will see that this, these basically are a, a very, very rich sources of uh, fish, you know, crab and many other uh, food that we eat. And then secondly, uh, the medicines, there are many mangrove species which are uh, medicinally important, particularly they are used as a part of ethnomedicine. But recently, the scientific uh, community has proved their uh, medicinal importance through, uh, you know, different pharmacological mechanisms, pharmacological studies. Other important uh, points that, that needs to be considered are, you see here, this is the uh, demonstration of a sea on one side and on the other side, you have this land. And these mangroves occupy a very, very important uh, you know, locations uh, between the land and sea. You can see these mangroves within uh, this uh, particular area. Now, what is, what is the importance of these mangroves? They basically act as a bio shields for the coastal communities and protect them from natural disasters. Then they protect shorelines from erosion, help mitigate uh, global carbon emissions in the sense that these mangroves are one of the most productive ecosystems. Uh, that's why these mangrove ecosystems are also known as group urban uh, ecosystem VCEs because of uh, their uh, very very high capacity to sequester carbon and then uh, you know store high amounts of uh, carbon in their biomass and uh, these mangrove habitats therefore are very rich uh, sources of uh, this blue carbon. So in that way they act as a very, very important components against uh, uh, climate change. Then they support unique microbiota. Not only these mangroves are unique in their different uh, adaptive traits, but if you look at uh, other microbiota within that, they are also unique. For example, bacteria or the fungi that they grow in, their, in this ecosystem, they are also very, very different from the other uh, fungi or the bacteria. Other important things that they do is this water purification and detoxification because their roots are such that the purification of water is uh, done by the roots. Groundwater recharging is another important benefit that these mangroves play. Then this attenuation of the sea waves and the wind velocity when there is a high speed wind and sea waves. These waves are basically, uh, you know, uh, reduced in strength because of the presence of this bio shield, 
kind of uh, mangroves in the coastal areas. So that is how they protect the coastal communities. Another important thing is that these are very, very suitable uh, uh, grounds for aquaculture, including ship and fisheries. And they trap off a uh, runoff of the upland um, sediments. Whatever uh, you know, sediments come, they, they act as a uh, trapping um, plants for that kind of sediments. So in that sense, these ma uh, mangroves have multiple roles for the coastal communities, particularly for the coastal resilience. And recently, there has been an increasing evidence in support of their role against uh, different natural disasters, including tsunami uh, and uh, floods, because their extensive root system, secondary root systems, uh, particularly those aerial roots, uh, the network of aerial roots act as a very, very important barrier uh, against these uh, waves and to protect the coastal community. And recently, they have been a part of NBS, which is nature based solutions, or we call it as uh, you know, nature based ecological engineering to prevent uh, the natural disasters or to at least get rid of or to reduce the impact of those natural disasters. This, these are the, uh, some of the photographs that we have taken during our field studies. You can see their uh, extensive root systems. They act as walls and when there, is, there are huge waves, they are trapped within these uh, extensive root systems and they are, and the communities that stay beyond uh, these mangroves, they are protected from uh, the negative impact of these uh, years during these natural disasters. Now uh, you can, if there is an evidence in, in support of these mangroves having a positive role, then you, you see this, this was an uh, uh, article published in this particular online uh, portal. Tsunami Awareness Day. Here is how mangrove forests turned unsung heroes of 2014 tsunami. There is an evidence which says that these mangroves, actually wherever there were mangroves, there, were, there was less damage to the infrastructure as well as to the coastal communities. Which shows their importance in the, uh, in the, in the coastal resilience for the coastal communities. Now the, the issues, what are the issues related to the mangroves currently? Why, why we, we are doing research on the mangroves? Why people are concerned about uh, these mangroves, the unique uh, forests or the unique ecosystems, which have huge roles, the roles that we just saw now. What, is, what are the different issues? So issues are like, the conversion of mangrove forests for agriculture and aquaculture, you know, this arrows indicate that these mangroves uh, forests are shrinking. You can see that from the, uh, this is a sea, and there is a sea level rise nowadays, you know, because of uh, melting of the ice, uh, that is then because of uh, uh, global warming. And because of that, sea level rise, the sea will come towards the land side and from the land side there is a pressure. Pressures due to the mangrove land conversion and use for non-mangrove activities. So as a result of which this mangrove uh, habitats are being destroyed or they are being shrinked to a level that beyond that they will not be able to uh, recover. So in that kind of a situation when mangroves are no longer available, uh, you can imagine uh, the fate of the coastal communities particularly uh, considering their huge role for uh, their existence. These mangroves are a part and parcel of the coastal communities. So if you remove them, that will be a, uh, you know, 
great tra tragedy for the coastal communities because of that. So, why this is an issue? For example, if you take the example of some other important species of plants, which, which you can uh, conserve in other areas, for example, access to conservation in botanical gardens or other places where you can conserve these uh, species for future use. But that is different because these venues have their importance because they are present in that location between the land and the sea. So they act as a barrier against uh, uh, the, the sea waves and tsunami floods and all those things. So preventing the coastal communities. So from the perspective of the humans, their conservation should be in their particular location itself. If you conserve these mangroves away from their uh, natural habitat, it has a very less relevance. Although it may be good for conserving the species as such, but they will not serve the purpose of uh, uh, of this kind of a uh, role for prevention of the coastal community. Other important thing is that these coastal uh, these mangroves have a very, very unique lifestyle in the sense that they, they survive only in this kind of a uh, hypersaline conditions. They, they cannot survive on terrestrial uh, habitat or they cannot survive under fresh water. Up to limited point of time, they may survive, but beyond that, these plants need optimal uh, stress conditions then only they can uh, survive. So that is the uh, tragedy of uh, uh, narrowing of the mangrove habitats. And there is a pressure from both sides. So mangroves are facing these issues. So then lack of awareness among the people and the undervaluation of the roles of mangroves, the importance of mangroves, people do not know that what important roles they play. That is why they cut it and replace it with modern agriculture, which is, which is not good basically for uh, survival of the members. Other is illegal encroachments, you know, the over-exploitation, habitat destruction. Uh, over-exploitation is for medicinal purposes or uh, felling of the trees for wood and uh, expansion of settlements, roads, building, construction activities towards the land side. And another issue, particularly since I am working in Kerala, what we have found is this, the private ownership of the land. So most of the land on which mangroves are found uh, is owned privately by the private uh, individuals, which means that we cannot enforce the legal uh, laws, uh, the laws that are there in general for the prevention of uh, forest uh, related laws or for that matter those laws which are particularly uh, aimed at mangroves because private land is the property of the individuals and government cannot do that enforce any laws on that so therefore they are free to do whatever they want uh, against the man uh, mangroves so that is the reason why these mangroves are uh, using day by day and then, you know, in what we can do to conserve them, there are various uh, important things. But one important thing that I will discuss today is this genetic studies and genomic studies to understand their adaptation. Particularly, we do not know how much, uh, how do they survive? What are the different mechanisms uh, that they use to survive under this kind of uh, stressful conditions? So I will be using this word stressful conditions, intertidal um, environment. Intertidal environment means those environments in which these mangroves are surviving. So other important issues uh, that that is with respect to the mangroves is this one, the plastic and the microplastic pollution, which is also a huge um, 
you know, it creating huge problems uh, to the members. So you can see various microplastics, uh, which is recently you must have heard about uh, the biggest uh, you know, pollution threat, not only to the humans, but also to the uh, aquatic animals and aquatic plants, including mangroves. But there is not much research on that. So this paper we have basically published in environmental science and pollution research. It's a review article, basically. So uh, you can see various sources of uh, different plastics, and then they through various chemical, physical, and biological degradation processes turn into microplastics, and then they also threaten the survival of the mangroves. You can see this kind of pollution is existence in different mangrove areas, and this is just a, uh, you know tip of the iceberg. There are uh, many places which are more polluted than this, and then other pollutants like uh, heavy metals, which I have not uh, discussed here. So the mangroves are threatened with all these issues. And looking at the IUCN uh, categories, IUCN, you know, threat uh, of uh, out of the total seventy-three true mangrove species. You can see that three species are critically endangered, three are endangered, seven are vulnerable, and you know five are uh, near threatened and remaining are least concerned. But this kind of a statistics uh, is alarming, which means that uh, if the current situation continues, then the mangroves. Uh, Will no longer be present in the in the in the uh, on this planet. Now, as I was talking about, uh, you know, different different uh, stresses that are dominating in the intertidal zones, and what are the different unique uh, adaptive traits to these environmental conditions? So this is an area which actually we are also working in our lab uh, with the help of PhD students. So on the left side, you have the stresses and on the right side, you have different uh, mechanisms by which mangroves adapt to the, uh, this kind of uh, intertidal stressful conditions. Salinity is the number one uh, stressor in this kind of a uh, habitat, hypoxia, because there is a, always a water logging and mangroves are always submerged in the water. There is no access to uh, oxygen. So the hypoxia is, uh, is, is another stress condition due to water logging. So then heavy, heavy matter stress and then nutrient stress. And then recently this temperature stress is also seen as, a, uh, as an important stress factor in the mangroves. But inherently, these are the important uh, stresses, salinity, hypoxia, water logging, heavy metal stress, and nutrient stress. These are important stresses that are found in the mangrove habitats. And these mangroves have evolved peculiar uh, mechanisms to cope with this. For example, the salt secretion. Salt secretion is a mechanism by which leaves secrete salt through their leaves. You will, you will be surprised to see, uh, you know, you can see with your naked eyes the deposition of salt on the leaves of the, uh, some of the species of the mangroves. Then vivipad, what is vivipad is? Since the salinity, there is a very, very high salinity in the, uh, in their habitat, if if the if the plants drop their seeds in the saline conditions, there will be uh, issues with related to germination because you must have seen that the higher salinity is a big issue for germination. It means that it creates a stress and plants cannot uh, germinate. So so they, these plants have evolved a mechanism by which they can avoid 
these saline conditions so so they they germinate their seeds while they are attached to the mother plant so they are avoiding the salinity stress through uh, this we parry mechanism and because once this germination is over uh, then the plants will have some amount of tolerance and when they fall on on the on the water they can uh, they can uh, survive they can go to the shore and they establish there and then they germinate they establish and then they start growing there then nematophores you must have seen very beautiful structures coming from uh, the soil towards the up, upwards so they are negatively geotropic systems kind of roots which come up above the uh, soil and they they, they are used for uh, they are acting as a breathing roots then another is this ultra filtration ultra filtration means you see this has the salinity is very very high it means it, it goes of the normal plants normal plants will not be able to survive even for hours at a salinity which is present so the plants at the root cell root uh, roots itself they deploy certain mechanism in which the salt is you know uh, filtered at the root and then they take up the water which is free of the salt that kind of a mechanism uh, which we call as ultra filtration so we will look at some of the molecular uh, mechanisms of uh, these uh, this particular adaptations this is also from our uh, recent uh, paper which was published in i science and this is uh, this is the important figure uh, which shows you which shows you the evolution of evolution of the mangroves we can we need to find, you know look at what point of time these mangroves must have um, evolved uh, on this Uh, planet earth so you can see here uh, on the lower side are the fossils of different mangroves which we have recovered uh, we means the scientific community like abyssinia leaf fossils are uh, recovered from maybe 9 uh, 100 million years ago uh, these are the dates on the lower side million million years ago and the dates of these fossils is uh, you know uh, determined to various step naipa is another member abyssinia naipa pollen grains leaves wood of sonaracea agilatus brugeria and the acanthus so you can see that different fossils are recovered from different time periods suggesting that these the mangroves have evolved uh, you know this this is the age of the evolution of mangroves late cretaceous and between this paleocene through whole genome duplication there is a whole genome duplication which has resulted in the evolution of this mangroves ugeria gymnorhiza rhizophora theriops candelia these are uh, some of the most prominent mangroves which are given here and they are different from other uh, uh, terrestrial uh, plants like resinus populus and you can see this phylogenetic uh, tree it shows a different lineage for the mangroves so it means that they have evolved a different kind of mechanisms through uh, through this evolutionary divergence and whole genome duplication now uh, looking at their uniqueness one by one i will discuss uh, this two or three mechanisms first i will be looking at salinity tolerance how they 
survive this salinity tolerance uh, survive under this high very very high salinity so this is a uh, this diagram may be looking little you know complex to you but i will try to make it uh, make you understand see this is uh, this is a representation of a plant cell and the other activities that are taking place this is a nucleus and uh, this is uh, its uh, Here and different mechanisms are shown. Like for example, if there is a salinity stress, salinity stress is then uh, responsible for the production of reactive oxygen species. You must you must be knowing about what are reactive oxygen species. Uh, they basically are uh, dangerous molecules for the uh, plant. They they can they can uh, cause DNA damage. And also, they can cause uh, lipid peroxidation. So, which means that if they uh, do DNA damage or if they do the lipid peroxidation, it means they will destroy the disturb the integrity of the cells. If that happens, uh, then there will be damage to the plant itself. But when there is a very very high salinity, how plants cope with it? Plants. Have a mechanism, uh, different mechanisms are there. For example, the first mechanism is to neutralize this reactive oxygen species because reactive oxygen species are not important for a plant. They must be neutralized to uh, other molecule which is which is less harmful for the plant, which is H2O2 through the action of superoxide dismutase. This, this enzyme converts our ROS into H2O2. And then this H2O2 is a very important molecule which acts, uh, which, which promotes the biosynthesis of lignin. And this is the lignin uh, autofluorescence here. Lignin is a uh, polysaccharide which is required for the uh, which, is, which is found in the secondary cell. So in the roots, this particular lignin uh, uh, adds strength to the roots. Means, means once the roots become thick, they become less impermeable to the uh, salt or, or the uh, salt molecules. So it means that there is a physical barrier. You can see that there are biochemical mechanisms by which these plants uh, survive in the in the, in the high saline, saline zones and secondly it will increase uh, the deposition of lignin in the uh, Casparian strips, subarine lamellate and this subarine biosynthesis is you know promoted by um, different genes including ABC transcription factors, Wernicke transcription factors, CYP and still there are certain mechanisms which are uh, not known. But a kind of connections we have tried to make through this particular research article. One is the physical barriers at the ultrafiltration level through secondary wall thickness. Then this bio biochemical mechanism by superoxide dismutase and then H2O2, which is then further neutralized superoxidases into H2O and other molecules. Now this DNA dip, once DNA is damaged, how it is uh, repaired? DNA damage is repaired by the expression of genes such as PCNA, RFC1, UVHP, and RFA1. PCNA is a proliferating cell nuclear antigen. And RFC is a uh, replication factor C and uh, UV sensitive, hypersensitive protein 3 UV. And RFA is uh, replication factor A1. So that is uh, the mechanism by which DNA repair is done. 
now this sos which is known as uh, which is which is an important na positive as positive uh, antiporter for plasma membrane which is facilitated by so2 and so3 uh, for for the you know removal of excess ions from the plant and then this is the nhx1 is another uh, uh, antiporter which is vacuolar uh, na positive h positive antiporter excess sodium uh, ions are deposited into the uh, vacuoles within the cell so it means that it is compartmentalized so excess salt is compartmentalized through which plants will uh, try to survive under high salinity conditions so one is dna damage other is uh, through uh, secondary uh, cell wall thickenings superin biosynthesis casparian lignin neutralization of reactive oxygen species and then compartmentalization of the excess points and then h2o2 also acts uh, in the closure of the stomata because the salinity stress increases osmotic uh, stress or it disturbs the osmotic uh, osmoticum of the plant so the plants should uh, therefore close their stomata so h2o2 then acts as a signaling molecule for stomata closure so this is the uh, integrated mechanism of how the plants uh, survive under salinity stress second important mechanism is uh, this viviparia so viviparia you can see that these are these are basically what you see here we call them as propagules which means that they are the you know, germinated embryos these are basically the embryos of the plants or the new plantlets they are ready to uh, you know uh, they they are ready to start their life generally what happens when the seed formation is taking place so plants will undergo some kind of a dormancy dormant period and then they will wait for some kind of favorable conditions before you know, they start germination but here that dormancy period is not there so the plants are you know this new seeds are germinating while they are attached with the plant itself so you can see this this some of them are very green some of them is brownish color so the, the this kind of a coloration indicates the maturation of these propagules but they are uh, you know brownish dark brown in color they will uh, drop from the plant and they will uh, float in the plant and then they will use the shoots there, there is also very beautiful story of how plant uh, once they fall into the uh, into the water uh, they will not directly go to the their itself they they are, you know uh, very nicely they they are structured you see this their shape itself in the middle they are thick and at the tip they are very thin needle like structure that is this kind of evolution is to make them float on the surface of the water so that they do not sink down if they sink within the water they will not be able to survive so they first they need to find a shore or a substratum where they will go and then start germinating so this mechanism is very beautiful there there is one paper which is you know published on this uh very beautiful experiment is demonstrated in the lab in which they uh, float these mango propagules in the water and they do not sink their cell but they will occupy uh, the shores and then they start this uh, the size of this is little small uh, i have taken this particular uh, picture carefully from this our paper only but i will try to make you understand uh, in a uh, detailed manner one important key gene is there which is required for uh, you know vivipar 
whether its loss is required from the living time, the, this living time. So this, the name of this plant is DOG1, delay of germination 1. And in case of non-viviparous fruits, its expression uh, is normal. And so the plants are not basically viviparous. They, they produce normal seeds. They will undergo dormancy and then germination. But uh, another plant in which there is a loss of game binding property due to mutation. This particular uh, gene or the protein of this particular gene has a heme binding property. Heme means affin, iron binding property. So its loss leads to crypto -vivary. crypto -vivary means it is a kind of a intermediate stage of vivipary. It's not a full vivipary, but intermediate stage of the vivipary. What happens when there is a complete loss of this particular gene as shown by this cross? It promotes vivipary. You can see there is a uh, unfertilized uh, ovary when there is a uh, fertilization of the ovary and then there is a, uh, <clears throat> you know, embryo producing from the seed coat and it starts increasing and then you have a full fleshed elongated embryo uh, or the uh, small plant that is ready to start a new life. So this is an example of VV parasitopia. So what happens uh, due to the loss of this DOG bond? DOG loss results in the uh, accumulation of GA concentration. GA is the gibberellin, and you know that gibberellin uh, synthesis is basically required for the it, it's required for the uh, germination. And ABA concentration, you can see, it's reducing as the germination starts. Its concentration starts reducing. It means that. And ABA is, is inhibitor of the germination and promoter of the dormancy. So on the left is your situation that favors dormancy and the right side is the situation which promotes viviparous germination. And increase in biosynthesis of GA is uh, done by Important genes like GA20OX, GA3OX, AAO gene, KS gene. And the, the, the reduction of, uh, uh, on, the, on the other side, there is a reduction of PA uh, and the expression of the key genes, uh, which are, which are uh, required for this uh, PA biosynthesis. And on the other side, you can see this uh, increasing ABA uh, inactivation. Whatever gene you see down here, which, which, which are required for the degradation or, or the inactivation of the ABA. And on the left side, they are, uh, they, they, uh, their concentration is also reducing. So it is opposite GA. Synthesis promotes your uh, vivipary and the degradation of ABA. The two conditions should be there the degradation of ABA and the, uh, uh, the biosynthesis of the gibralic acid. Right. So, this is how this vivipary is regulated uh, genetically. Now, you have this uh, hormonal crosstalk in all these different uh, adaptations. First is this, in the absence of DOG1, uh, the ABA uh, pathway is innovated while GA biosynthesis is promoted that leads to the formation of this UV pairing, means seed germination. And on this, on the right side, you can see the binding of ABA to this PPC, PP2C gene breaks off its inhibitory role on SNRK2 gene, which is another gene. 
and then SNRK2 uh, phosphorylates the transcription factors like MYB, AB2, ERP, DP, and RP. And their upper aggregation takes place, which results in the formation of EB biosynthesis, and then that will lead to the stomatal uh, closure during osmotic balance. That's what we discussed uh, here. So, see different, the, all these uh, mechanisms are linked. There is a hormonal crosstalk between these different mechanisms. Under hypoxia, hypoxia means there is, when there is a lack of oxygen, the, the root, there is a formation of arenthema. Arenthema formation means the formation of air spaces in the, in the root. Under hypoxia, this PP2 C genes are upregulated which inhibit the phosphorylation of transcription factors by SNRK2 and thus lowering the expression of S, uh, ABA responsive genes, this kind of gene, and that will increase the formation of errant term. Increase the rate of uh, this errant term of formation. On the other side, there is a ethylation, uh, this ethylene which then upregulates uh, this ERF gene, which is ethyl, uh, ethylene uh, response factor one, and which in turn uh, upregulates those genes which are ethylene responsive genes, and then also they will form result in the formation of RNA. So this this is how these main groups adopt to this very peculiar kind of a uh, condition, a very very stressful conditions so we can call them as warriors it's, it's not easy to survive under this kind of a uh, stressful conditions uh, so that is why these mangroves are very very ex uh, excellent models uh, to study the stress tolerance mechanism so what we uh, do in our lab is basically all around what i showed you and these are some of the figures uh, which show you this is my student collecting the propagules and taking some readings and we need to go using these boats which is quite risky sometimes also but we have to be very very cautious collect the propagules and other material materials which are used in our lab so these are two model species uh, two species candelia candle and the rhizophora mucronate on which we are working in our lab and we are particularly interested in studying the, uh, how these plants uh, <clears throat> you know, adapt to stressful conditions. So this is the example of uh, Candelia candle and then Rhizophora micronata and uh, you can see High salinity is reducing their biomass. And at the root level also, it uh, affects mangroves. And this is just the preliminary uh, results of our study. We have not yet published this work. So uh, I, I, I have finished this uh, talk. Uh, now, if there are any questions, I can answer and I can interact with new students. So uh, if any of the participants have any questions, you can uh, put forward. Hey, no, sir, no question. No, sir, no question. Uh, so, if there are no questions, thank you, Dr. Rajay, for uh, your value, valuable information that you have shared with our students. Uh, we are highly obliged that uh, you would agree to deliver a lecture in such a short notice and uh, gave us time from your busy schedule. I thank you on behalf of the college and the organizing team. 
थैंक यू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू फॉर द अपॉर्चुनिटी थैंक यू थैंक यू आई थिंक आई कैन एक्सेप्ट नो या या हेलो हां सर हां हां अजय शैल आई लीव या या था thank you thank you for your generosity okay, okay thank you thank you all for joining and listening thank you